Oh, Lord, thank you so much again, just for the opportunity of being able to share your word this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the seed of your word. Always, Lord, there's nothing wrong with your word. It's always us, the soil that needs to be worked over. So I pray that you give us a heart that is receptive to hear what you have to say to us. And that we'd actually go away thinking about things from here this morning. And then putting those things into action. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, um, thank you all for coming. Good to see you all here. We finished off the parables last week. What parable was that? And the talents. So you got two for one, didn't you? Two for the price of one. Parable of the talents, parables of the miners. All linked in there. And we wrapped that up. So we've now moved on. And we are looking at another parable today, aren't we? Because apparently I'm the pastor of the parables. Or something like that. Something like that. In the, in the Jewish Jerusalem church. Or something like that. As apparently we're, we're tagged. Bizarre, eh? Anyway, so what we're going to be looking at now is the parable of the growing seed. And what's all that about? What's the parable of the growing seed all about? Um, it, having looked at it, it would probably have been better for me to link this parable with, with, a, number of, with a number of others that are interconnected. Um, but as I've been taking the parable sequence out of the back of one of my old study Bibles, that's not the way that it's recorded. So... I think that that's probably because this parable is found only in the Gospel of Mark, only found in the Gospel of Mark, um, whereas the parables that sit either side of this parable are found in varying forms, at least, in the other synoptic Gospels, so in Matthew and in Luke, okay? But I guess what I want you to try and understand is that this parable forms part of a sequence that the Gospel writer of Mark has placed it. So it's forming part of a sequence, right? You can't just, you can lift it out and you can speak on it just as it is, but it forms part of a sequence of events. It's, got a, it's, it's been situated there by the, by the gospel writer for a purpose. So while we can look at the standalone message to get a, to get a fuller and to get a, get a richer understanding, we need to see where this parable is situated. So it's found in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 4. Now, for those who are um, observant here, this begins with Jesus around a lake, teaching a large crowd. That is a lake, and they are elephants. So I just wanted to see if you're awake, um, just before we even get into this. So, Jesus wasn't teaching elephants. I'm not suggesting that. I just wanted to see if you were awake. It's a lake with elephants okay that's not scriptural just so that you know anyway in fact the the crowd was so big according to mark that what jesus did was he got into a boat and he went out into the lake and for those of you know anything about acoustics when you're out on the lake and you're speaking back the sound travels really well so it was a great way for jesus to teach and address dozens hundreds of people because of the the way that the sound travels backwards. Brilliant. So, Jesus then kicks off with this parable of the sower and the seed falling on various types of ground. You know, we all know the parable of the sower. I've taught on this one already back in 2019. This is how long we've been tracking through these parables. And, um, you know, the rocky ground, the shallow ground, the good ground, all of that sort of stuff. We've, We've gone through all of that. And then, later on, when he's alone... Alone with the 12 disciples. He tells them what the parable's purposes are. And we read about that in Mark 4, 10 to 11. And it says this. When he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. And then following that, what he does is he goes on to explain the parable of the sower to them. That's the rocky, the, you know, the shallow ground and the good ground, all of that sort of stuff. It's a terrible, terrible tag. It's not got nothing to do with the soil. It's actually all about the soils. It should be the parable of the soils, really. But there we go. And then he goes on to teach about the parable of the lamp, which we read about in verses 21 to 25. And then he talks about the parable of the growing seed, which is the parable that we're looking at. And then he talks about the parable of the mustard seed, which is in verses 30 to 32. 
And then all of this little section from being at the lake, teaching through these parables, it's all wrapped up at verse 33 and 34. Then Mark records, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Don't you just wish that you had been in some of those conversations? In, to be able to earwig? Because then you pick up the Bible and you go, oh yeah, I know what he means now. Because we'd had those private offline conversations. But unfortunately, we weren't there. We've now got to try and dig into it. And the other thing that I've noticed when I was looking at some of the commentaries that surround this, some of, some of the commentaries suggest that because Jesus was talking to this very large crowd in, by the lake initially, that he also spoke this parable, the one that we're going to be looking at, to that same large crowd. But that isn't the placing of this in Scripture. Because verse 10 clearly tells us that this series of parables was at that time spoken to those around him with the 12 disciples, and he was alone. So that doesn't sit right with me from the commentaries that I've looked at. Now, some or all of the parables may have been spoken to a much wider audience. Different times, different places, different settings, different reasons. But we've got to remember, you know, Jesus didn't just use his message as a one-off. And that's it. And, and, and the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John account of Jesus' time on earth isn't a full account of Jesus' time on earth. I mean, hopefully we all are mature enough to understand that. The writers of the Gospels have recorded sufficient information in those Gospels to enable us to know who he is. Not, it's not a blow-by-blow blow chronological account of Jesus being born and going to the cross and rising from the dead. It's not that. There's a lot of stuff that would have happened which we are not aware of. And here we're given a clue. He also had private sidebar conversations with his disciples and he told them all about how to unpack the parables. Oh, don't you wish we had that? Because then we wouldn't be tracking two years on and still only halfway through them. But anyway, so there was this private hearing and Jesus flags up that this is all li linked to the secret of the kingdom of heaven. The secret of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this word secret is the Greek word mysterion. Mysterion. Da, da, da. What word do you think that we get from mysterion? Mystery. This was the mystery. This was the mysterion. It means a hidden thing, the secret, the mystery, something that really wasn't obvious to the understanding. It had a hidden purpose or it was hidden counsel. It could also mean the secret will of God. The secret counsels which govern God in dealing with the righteous. Things which are hidden from the ungodly. Things which are hidden from wicked men and women. But, but really plain to the godly. So the disciples, they were given this insight into the secret, the mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. They were given, to, they were given a key to see to understand what wasn't clearly obvious to others. They were given insight to see how God would deal with things and then how those things would be acted out. What they weren't given is they weren't given insight into microchip technology in the future. They weren't given knowledge of what the future events were going to be. The insight that they were given was around and surrounded this the mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And again, when I, when I look in commentaries, there's much discussion around what the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of God is actually about. And I've looked in a number of commentaries as I was trying to put this together. Uh, the, the New English Translation Study Bible, which is a really good, really good study Bible, records this. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, they're, they're synonymous terms, is a major theme of Jesus' teaching. The nature of the kingdom of God in the New Testament and in Jesus' teaching has long been debated by interpreters and scholars, with discussion primarily centering around the nature of the kingdom, earthly, heavenly, or both, and the kingdom's arrival, present, future, or both. An additional major issue concerns the relationship between the kingdom of God and the person and the work of Jesus himself. So... What none of these notes actually tell me, and what none of them have spoken into, is 
How would a Jewish rabbi understand the concept of the kingdom of God? How would a Jewish rabbi understand it? And I find that absolutely fascinating because all this dancing around the edges trying to make something uh, fit a narrative that we have now created over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of church tradition, in my view, doesn't really cut it. In relation to another parable, Brad Young, uh, in, in his book, The Parables, Jewish Tradition and the Christian Interpretation, he made this point. One must listen to Jesus as he tells the parable and see the story in light of rabbinic literature and the rich heritage of the first century Jewish people. We've got to make sure that we wear the right lens when we look at the teachings of Jesus. Because the same principle is valid for all of Jesus' parabolic teaching, his, his teaching around the parables. We must look at them in light of rabbinic understanding. We must look at them in light of the rich heritage of the Jewish people. And so many times we don't do that. So many times we don't go back to the root. We don't go back to the source. We don't ask ourselves, what did this mean to those original hearers? What did it mean to them? This mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. What did it mean to first century Jewish believers steeped in Jewish tradition? And in the teaching around these parables and riddled throughout the whole of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, whenever Jesus speaks of the concept of the kingdom of heaven or the concept of the kingdom of God, he does so from his worldview. Not from our worldview, looking back from a point of Christendom, He's speaking from his Judaic worldview as a first century Jewish rabbi. How would he have understood this? And I've banged on about this so many times that I'm sure that you'll all be sick of it. Malkut Shemayim, Malkut Shaddai, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. This is all about the rule, the reign, the sovereignty of God here on earth in contrast, in contrast to those worldly powers. And in doing so, it actually presents this alternative social reality. It presents an alternative way of living to what we see around us. This is what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God was about. Bringing that rule, that reign, that sovereignty of God down to earth in such a way that it contrasts with those worldly powers. And so that we live an alternative to what we see. God is... The essence of this is that God is so close that his realm isn't some faraway place up here, but that his realm overlaps our realm in such a way that the people of God can live a life that demonstrates something so radically different. Where we see hate in the community, we should bring love. Where we see violence in the community, we should look to bring peace. Where we see poverty, we should look to relieve it. This is bringing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to earth. Real practical stuff. And I've said so many times, it's about getting stuck in here, in the here and the now, using the skills, using the talents, using the time, using the energy that you have to make real time changes and to benefit real living people here. Now, this is not and it never was about some static place in a far off land where one day when we pop our clogs here on earth, we go and float off to. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not the kingdom of heaven. That was never the concept of the kingdom of heaven. Never the concept of the kingdom of God. And if you sit here and you still think that that is the concept of the kingdom of God, then I would encourage you to open your Bibles and really begin to study what heaven is. I'd also encourage you to study what hell is. There are some really good, solid Christian men and women who have got some fascinating views on all of this. Good, solid, biblical views. Uh, I like the way that N.T. Wright uh, looks at this. Western Christians have imagined that at the end of the day, God is going to throw away the present space-time universe into a trash can and we'll be sitting on clouds playing harps. The ultimate future that we're promised is much more interesting than that. It's new heavens and a new earth 
with new bodies to live in. God isn't just going to wipe the decks and we go floating off somewhere to sit on clouds plucking harps. Not what it's about. That's not what heaven is. This is really, 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 really worth exploring. Because when you do, you'll begin to understand the concept of heaven and the kingdom of heaven. And it will change the way you live your life. It will change the way you live your life. And it will change you for the better. Because ultimately, you will end up doing what you're meant to be doing here. You will end up doing what you're meant to be doing here in the first place. And hopefully, that's the place that we're going to end up tracking through as we work through this parable. So you'll see that, I hope. So we're going to turn back to the parable then. Jesus was opening up this mysterion, this mystery, this secret to the disciples. And in this, what he was doing, he was giving a real clear signal of intent that there was a radical new way to live life since he, Jesus, God, clothed himself in humanity in the person of Jesus Christ and walked amongst his creation. There's a whole radical new way of doing life. It's going to be countercultural. It's going to demonstrate something so different that folk around would have to take note. And look at what happened with the first century church. Look at what happened. The explosion of belief in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so much like the seed in this parable, that way of living was going to grow, it was going to spread until it reached that point, until it could be harvested. Let's have a quick look at the parable then. Mark 4, 26 to 29, nice and short. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in, in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So, I had a look at this in the Passion Translation. Passion Translation renders it like this. Jesus also told them this parable. God's kingdom realm is like someone spreading seed on the ground. He goes to bed and gets up day after day. And the seed sprouts and grows tall, though he knows not how. All by itself, it sprouts. And the soil produces a crop. First the green stem, then the head on the stalk, and then the fully developed grain in the head. And then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts the sickle to the grain because the harvest time has come. One of the things I think that we should note when we look at this little parable is that contained within these very few verses, we see a complete picture of what the kingdom of heaven is and what the realm of that kingdom is. You see, we have, the, we have the sowing of the seed. We have the growth of the seed. We have the development of the seed as it pushes sprouts, stem, stalk, fully developed grain. And finally, we have the harvest, when that grain is ripe. And we know from previously looking at the parable of the sower in Mark, as I said, poorly named, because uh, it's about the soils, but we know, when we had a look at that parable, that the seed is what? What is the seed? Can you remember? What is the seed? The word of God. The seed is the word of God. And the soils are what? The hearers. The hearers of the word of God, right? So we have the seed, which is the word of God, and we have the hearers, the soil. So in the parable of the sower, there is an emphasis on the different type of soil, wasn't there? But not in this little parable of Mark. Not in this one. The seed goes straight into the soil and it grows. It just quietly gets on with it. So the seed just goes straight into the soil and grows. Quietly gets on with it. And this growth, while unseen, while unnoticed, just happens. And the seed does exactly what a seed is meant to do. The growth process starts. And the seed, what's the seed? And the seed 
gives impetus for the change to happen. The word of God gives impetus for the change to happen. The word of God, as it equates to the seed in this parable, does exactly that in a life. The word of God gives the impetus for a change to happen. God, in the quiet, in the unseen, often in the darkness that may enshroud it, would cause that seed that was planted in the ears, in the, in the minds, in the hearts of many people to germinate into new life and to grow. The word of God, the word of God targets the, the soulish areas of humanity, the mind, the will, the emotion, the emotion, all of those soulish areas. All of the things that make up the condition of the human being. The word of God targets that. And this, this area is the battleground. This is the battleground where things are either snatched from us or where our victories are secured. This is the area that we fight day after day. Paul tells us that we're up for a fight in this life. Paul tells us that we're up for a fight and he spells it out in that great passage to the church in Ephesus when he tells them, you need to kit yourselves up properly. Kit yourselves up properly because we are going into battle. But what you mustn't miss is where a really good part of that struggle actually lies. It isn't isn't against demonic foes that we can blame everything on. We can't do that. Oh, no, the devil made me do it. No, no, you're stupid enough to give the devil a day off sometimes. It's not the devil making you to do things. We need to to be careful of how we we word these things. Paul tells us where our battleground is in Ephesians 6 verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Powers. Powers which is the second thing he mentions there, is that little Greek word exousia. And exousia is your power of choice. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the power of our choice, against the liberty to do what we want, our free will. This is the power of choice. This is where our battleground is, and this is where it happens. This is where it happens. How do you choose, people? How do you choose? Do we maintain our autonomy, our will, or do we say to God, your will, not mine? Because as we allow him to have his way, as we allow him to have his way, this word of God through the person of the Holy Spirit, begins to press against our soul, it begins to press against our mind, it begins to press against our will and our emotions. And he begins to do what he does best, which is to convict us of our condition. And then to start to change us, to put us under pressure, to pull at our desires, to pull at our thoughts, to pull at our attitudes of our hearts, And the growing process begins. We start to push out sprouts. And I don't mean Brussels sprouts. We start to push out sprouts. We start to develop a stem. We start to grow a stalk before finally reaching a a fully developed grain. And that act of growing may be less than comfortable. That act of growing may have associated growing pains on it. Because this is a journey of development. Our walk is a journey of development. Oswald Chambers writes, the life of faith is not a life of mounting up with wings, but a life of walking and not fainting. It's not about flying up here with the eagles. It's about just getting up off your backside and staggering on day after day after day after day, especially when you don't want to. This is what Christian faith is like. We don't arrive somewhere fully formed. 
It's a process that we have to go through. And it's a process that requires us to slog on and to keep slogging on. Maybe only staggering forward one step at a time, but slog on nevertheless. And this is why this this terrible evangelical formula of of the altar call of Lord Jesus come into my heart, amen, is, is so, so flawed. So flawed. While that can be used as a, as a start point for faith, too often I sense that it is a start point, a middle point and a finish point. It's a bit like the old park bench where you get yourself sat on it. We've said the magic words. We can now sit ourselves down. We can look out. Watch at the view, have a, just take in all of the view, and then we can wait for this, this heavenly bus to arrive and, and whisk us off to heaven someday. This is not what the Christian faith is about. Not at all. Once the word of God gives impetus for growth, we enter into a journey with Jesus. We enter into a journey. And a journey that takes us through a process of change that will continue to change us and keep changing us. And that change will ultimately lead to a harvest. We should be a people who don't have a conversion moment. We should be a people who live lives that are full of conversion moments. Every step is a growth step, right? It's the learning more about yourself. Picking yourself up when you've dropped the ball yesterday because you called somebody or you gestured something to somebody as they cut you up in the traffic. Everything is, is about growing. Everything is about conversion moments where once again we, we pick ourselves up and go, God, forgive me. Fill me a bit more with your grace because I've got a few holes in this bucket. And you know what? It doesn't matter if you've got a bucket with holes. Just allow him to pour it in because it will still get wet. It might flow out and go everywhere, but it doesn't matter. At least the bucket's getting wet. God works away at us, chip by chip by chip. And he forms us into the likeness of his son. Because this is the will of God for our lives. This is the general will of God, to conform each one of us to the likeness of his Son. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, long-suffering, merciful, kind, loving, all of those great things. The likeness of his Son. This is the general will of God, to conform each one of us to the likeness of his Son. Now, there may well be specific things that God wills for our lives, But the general will of God is very, very simple. Become like Christ. Become like Christ. C.S. Lewis writes, Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. And that doesn't mean become a new Jewish Messiah. He means a person who is completely conformed to the same likeness as Christ. That should be our goal. That should be our aim. That's what the Christian walk's about. Not about coming to church and singing hymns, but being like Christ. Sitting amongst the down and the out. Loving people wherever they are. Paul, writing to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3.11, notes this. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. This is the message that we should be teaching. This is the message that we should be preaching. If we aspire to anything... If we have a vision for anything, if we look to speak out a mantra for anything that we do, this is it. Christ is all and in all. It's all about him and nothing else. It's not about evangelical outreaches, no matter how good they may be. It's not about how many followers the church has on Instabook or Twitface. 
It's not about any of that. It's not about any other activity that we as an organisation do. It is about him. And then conforming to the likeness of the son. S-O-N. Paul lived his life by this. He was so convicted of the centrality of Jesus Christ. Yeshua Hamashiach. He was so convicted of it that he ultimately paid for it with his life. And as he walked this journey, he wrote to that church in Ephesus and he gave clear instructions to the direction that they and we should be growing. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful screams. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Building up the body, building up the body to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, growing into Christ. And when this happens, the kingdom of heaven is manifest on earth in a very real and very radical way. A way that will shock the world. It shocked the world then and it continues to shock the world today. A way that presents an alternative social reality to what's going on around us. And this couldn't be more true than in the Jewish community when Jesus was there teaching back in the day. It was almost like he was setting out a scene setter for those listeners that are around him. Hey, pay attention to me. I'm about to give you guys a heads up about how the kingdom of heaven is going to look in the future. Psst, it's a mysterion. It's a secret. Remember, he talked of the mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. And this word, as we've already looked at, was also used by Paul in a number of his writings. So I'll draw attention to one of those, which is, again, a letter to the church in Colossae. Colossians 1, 25 to 28. I became a servant of the church according to the stewardship from God given to me for you in order to complete the word of God. That is the mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to them the glorious riches of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him by instructing and in teaching all people with all wisdom so that we may present every person mature in Christ. The mysterion for Paul was the opening up of the good news to the Gentiles, the revelation of the body of Christ, the revelation of what the church is, and how in Jesus Christ, this, the complete swathe of humanity could once again enter into relationship with this great spirit that we call God the Father. And this mystery was revealed to Paul, was discussed with the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, and they then sanctioned that message that Paul took to them. They sanctioned it, and the rest, they say, is history. Because Paul took that message and he ran with it and he ran with it and he ran hard and he ran fast and he completed the course. And he preached a message of reconciliation, proclaiming that God in Jesus Christ, in Yeshua, had now set the pathway for reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. 
Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry, given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he was entrusted us to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. The old order has vanished. And this means that everything that links to our old identity has gone. Any acts we do to get right in our own strength. Any forms or ways of living that sit outside and are contrary to Jesus. Any power that had anything over us. All of that. All of those things have now gone. They've gone. They've vanished in Christ. They've all gone. We haven't just been given a makeover. We are a new creation in Christ by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. The work of Jesus has ushered in this new era, this new age, the age of grace. And because of that, our mission, the mission of the church, is to be his ambassadors. Is to be his ambassadors, pleading with others to listen to us. That's our mission. God isn't mad with you. God isn't mad with you. He loves you. And he wants you to be reconciled to him. That's the mission we've been given. The mission we have not been given is go out into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, preaching repentance, forgiveness of sins, baptising in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. That's not the mission of the church. I appreciate it's used it, is it? Paul tells us what the mission for the church is, which is get out there, speak to people, and tell them, God loves you. God isn't mad with you. Through Christ, he's opened the door for you to be reconciled to him. What do you want to do about it? Other things might then follow. I'm not negating the other things. I'm saying we need to understand what our mission is, the mission of the church. Because when we fulfill our mission, things will work. God in Jesus Christ, God in Jesus Christ is poetry in motion. God in Jesus Christ is poetry in motion. Jesus is the poetic masterpiece that became sin for us. That is, when it says he became sin for us, that is, he became the sin offering for us. He became the sin offering for us. A once and once only offering. Who, while suspended up there on that cross ushered in this new age, this new era of grace. The seed pushed through the kernel, pushed out the sprouts, the stem, the stalk, until fully formed grain was formed. And then finally, when that grain is ripe, we have the harvest, right? Revelation 14, 14 to 16, Then I looked. And behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest 
of the earth is fully ripe. And so he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. The earth, as in the parable, has done its bit. The word of God has given impetus for a believer to grow, for a believer to develop, for a believer to mature, right up until the time of that ingathering happens at the harvest. What that looks like, who knows? The language of John in Revelation is full of imagery that we need to be really carefully unpacking because otherwise we can make it more Hollywood than it is perhaps necessary to make it. But for us today, we should take on board the teaching of this parable, how it links to the countercultural life on earth today, and how we as recipients of this word of God can allow that to continue to infuse our lives so that we will grow, we will develop, we will become mature, and we will become productive. We may never ever have super ministries. We may never ever have mega churches. This is of course a mega church, made up of super people. But we may never have that. We may never even see the fruit of our labour. But we should live a life in such a way that we manifest the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, Malchut Shemai, Malchut Shaddai, here on earth now, today. And allowing him to have his way in our lives in order to conform us to the likeness of the Son for his glory and for his honour. You see, we are called to be a people who live with eyes focused on him with eyes focused on him through whatever we face. And when we do that, and when we continue to push up and to push through, the energy derived from the seed grows the plant to deliver fruit that's worth harvesting. The word of God empowers, infuses and produces and in putting all this into practice, our own desires, our own wants, our own leanings must give way to the way of God. We are to conform to the will of God. We truly seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And in doing so, we embark on a life that is rich, rich with purpose and rich with meaning. And Jesus demonstrated this in his own life. A life that was totally conformed to the will of God on earth. And the challenge that he is putting out to his followers is to really seek God's kingdom. The reign of God in their own life. In all aspects of their living. Allowing God to touch absolutely every aspect of our personal life as we live. Today. And it's as real back then when he spoke this, as it is today for us. Because once this happens, once a life is totally and completely devoted to Christ and his way, things will grow. And with continued growth comes the potential for a bounding harvest. So, grow, be ready to harvest. <coughs> Let's just pray. Lord, just in this little parable, we see some of the wonder, I believe, of your teaching. We see the revelation that you have provided to your people and the way that you point out for them how to live the best possible life. <coughs> May each one of us, Lord, look to bring our own living in line with your expectations. May we align our will to your will, rather than looking to get you to do what we want, like some sort of magic genie in the bottle. 
And as we obey you, Lord, and as we move forward, give us the ability to add to the harvest that one day you will reap. I pray that you keep our hearts and our minds and our will and our emotions focused totally on you. So that the truth of Paul's statement, Christ is all and in all, would be a truism for us today. Christ is all and in all. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the fact that you stepped down, you then stepped up, and you took our place as that one and only sin offering. And Lord, our words just do not do it justice. We just thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.